Welcome to a special edition of Oncology Today, focused on the management of metastatic pancreatic cancer. This is medical oncologist Dr. Neil Love. As a follow-up to a recent webinar with Dr. Eileen O'Reilly and Dr. Zev Weinberg, I met with Dr. Michael Pishvayan from the Johns Hopkins Kimmel Cancer Center in Washington, D.C. To begin, I asked them for his reaction to a case presented during the webinar by Dr. Weinberg. First, uh, let's sort of jump into some of the recent data sets. And, you know, it's great. Finally, we have a nice phase three trial, you know, the, to look at, um, looking at Naliri Fox. Uh, we actually uh, started out with a case presentation from Zev, a typical case, 63-year-old man, history of diabetes, presents with epigastric pain to the back, 10-pound weight loss. One exam had uh, scleral icterus and jaundice. Uh, ends up having a uh, uh, 4.5 by 4.1 uh, mass at the head of the pancreas, stents placed, uh, FNA of the liver shows adenocarcinoma, unable to get uh, NGS, uh, and the patient declined additional biopsy, germline testing, no abnormalities. And this patient actually went on the NAPLI-3 trial, did pretty well. I'll tell you about that in a second. But just to backtrack a little bit in terms of the workup, from your perspective, at least at the initial diagnosis of, in metastatic disease, as in this case, how important is it to get NGS and how productive is it? Uh, I think it's critically important. We know from the data, and this is data that represents probably more than 5,000 individual patients across 8 to 10 very large studies, that about 25% of all pancreas cancers harbor genetic or molecular alterations that could lead to specific therapies. In many cases, those specific therapies are platinum-based therapy, which we're probably going to use anyway, but there definitely are another 5 to 10% that are going to be outside-the-box type therapies that we wouldn't have normally used for pancreatic cancer. And I think it's really critically important to be able to get the, to get the NGS testing. I have to say that um, a recent presentation at ASCO 2023 um, with Dr. O'Reilly and Dr. Park's group looked at doing um, blood testing, blood CTDNA testing, and really kind of honing in or refining when we should be testing because we know that pancreas cancers are notoriously low shedders. They don't release a whole lot of CTDNA into the blood, and so it's not as useful as it is, for example, in lung cancer. But for patients that you know that you can't get a good tissue core biopsy just because there's not enough um, for example, not, not a large enough metastasis, and you're really left with just the primary tumor in the pancreas, more and more I've been sending uh, those patients' um, blood off for CTDNA testing. And it's kind of hit or miss. If you get a result and you see a KRAS mutation, thus signifying that there is a legitimate um, test that's been done, then you feel good about it. If, you, if it comes back and there's no mutations, including nothing in KRAS, then you probably just there just probably wasn't enough CTD in the blood. But it is definitely very important because it can definitely guide additional therapies. So uh, this patient had germline testing that was negative, and we'll talk about the NAPLI-3 trial. But just to, I don't know, just to sort of put out there, I'm just kind of curious. We'll, get, we'll talk in more depth about uh, PARP inhibitors later. But just at this point, I'm thinking about the, uh, you know, sort of the algorithm of what you're thinking how would it have been different if this patient, for example, had a BRCA germline mutation? How, what would your plan be at that point? Um, at that point, it would be to have in mind a plan to move on to maintenance therapy with a PARP inhibitor at some point down the line. So, for example, my threshold for tolerating side effects and symptoms uh, from the fulfirinox or the naliurfax would be, would be less. I'd be less willing to tolerate that because I know that I have another decent op option for them in the maintenance setting. I'm kind of curious, have PARP inhibitors been used by themselves up front before chemo, you know, window kind of trial in pancreatic cancer? To my knowledge, no, and we've definitely looked at this. You know, there is um, about three or four publications with PARP inhibitors in pancreas cancer, and all of them to date have been in previously treated patients, including pe patients previously treated with platinum-based therapy. Um, so there's no real sort of pure study. We're actually about to launch a study that will be a so-called pure study of BRCA-mutated platinum-naive patients. Um, 
uh, and one of the criticisms of our study is that we might not be able to find those patients because all of them will have received platinum already. And I think that's that's a legitimate concern. You know, I don't know if you're aware of it, but there was a little study, I think it uh, came out of MD Anderson uh, in breast cancer, where they used the, in BRCA, they used before they gave them anything. Again, it was sort of this window neoadjuvant truck was there, obviously, a, a totally different scenario, but they had a pretty high path CR rate. Wow. And I don't think it got you know followed up, although I was always like, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we definitely don't. I wish we knew, and we definitely don't know the pure response rate of a PARP inhibitor in, pancre- in BRCA mutated pancreatic cancer in a non platinum pretreated patient. So uh, this patient, of course, as I mentioned, um, was uh, negative, and, and at least in terms of germline, and actually went on the NAPLI-3 trial, actually was uh, randomized to uh, uh, go on the liposomal ranotecan arm. It did quite well, at least at the point of time that we were following up on the patient. Can you talk a little bit about the background to this study? You know, Zev was commenting that, you know, like he always viewed it as a, a trial for clinicians, for people in practice, because they, even though maybe it's not, you know, the exciting or CAR T or whatever, it was addressing a, an important question that clinicians face all the time. So can you talk a little bit about sort of the design of the NAPLI trial, the findings, and kind of what you think it means? It's an, it, the NAPLI trial asks an important question that's been lingering in our minds for more than 10 years. Whether a three drug, or I know that Eileen tends to call it a four drug combination because of the leucoborin. I still call it a three drug combination. But whether a three drug combination is truly better than a two drug combination in GemNAP pack. When those two regimens came out in Fulfirinox in 2011 and GemNAP pack in 2013, there was 10 years of which one is better. We don't know. There was multiple um, retrospective analyses, including a very large U.S. oncology retrospective analysis. And actually, the growing sentiment was that they were probably pretty much equivalent, including that U.S. oncology retrospective analysis, was that if you look at, if you kind of level the playing field with regards to performance status, it was almost exactly the same outcomes and survival rates between the two regimens. But we just never had prospective data in this in this realm. So the NAPLI trial was really valuable in giving us some prospective data comparing a three-drug um, Nalirafox slash Fulfirinox regimen versus the two-drug GemNAP pack. The trial was designed to show uh, a benefit with the three-drug regimen, and it did. I'm a little bit more skeptical about the results than others are uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that the overall survival for Nalirafox was 11.1 months. And as many have pointed out, sadly, the median overall survival in the original impact, tri- uh, sorry, in the original Accord trial, um, for Fulfirinox 10 years, 12 years ago was 11.1 months. So we've made exactly zero progress in 12 years with a three drug cocktail regimen. Of course, I'm comparing across trials. Um, but the other thing that really surprised me with the Napoli study, and it was a well run, very well run prospective international study. But the other com- criticism was that the GemNAP pack arm did much worse than what we've seen in some of the modern phase three trials where GemNAP pack was used to con- as a control arm. So the median overall survival in the GemNAP pack uh, arm was nine point, uh, I want to say two months, something a little bit above nine months. But actually in the, um, in the, in three phase three trials recently where GemNAP pack was a control arm, the median survival was about 11 months. So why did GemNAP pack underperform? I'm not sure that we necessarily know. Um, and again, I'm comparing across trials, but that was the only concern. So the bottom line is people have to make clinical decisions and you sort of evaluate based not only on data, but, you know, clinical experience, et cetera. Um, so, you know, there has been the feeling for a while, a lot of people have had the feeling that a three-drug regimen or four, whatever you want to call it, Fulfirinox, was a, somewhat better than Jebnab. D- did you feel that way? Uh, do you feel that way now, for example? I do feel that better. I, I do feel that now, um, and I have felt that, but I, I think it's really shades of gray. I don't think it's black and white differentiation. And, you know, if I've got a, an 82-year-old um, newly diagnosed metastatic pancreatic cancer patient that I feel perfectly comfortable starting that patient on GemNAP pack. 
um, I will not, I, I don't feel so compelled to start them on a three drug regimen necessarily. Now, the, it's a harder decision if they're 65, you know, or, or, or maybe it's not a harder decision. Maybe I, the 65 year old or the 50 year old, I definitely will start on a three drug regimen. Um, but it's not, I would not feel wrong about putting them on Gemnat Pack. Well, I guess in a way it's sort of starting to bring in the issue of tolerability when you bring up an 82 year old person. So I, I guess your, your thought, so, so let's focus just on efficacy first. Uh, and again, I kind of, it seems like there's a general feeling both on data and I guess other reasons that a uh, three drug re regimen is somewhat more efficacious. Let's put aside, you know, tolerability. Like you said, not a gigantic difference, but probably some difference so that if you have a younger patient or somebody who wants the very best possible therapy, that maybe there's an advantage to that. Just in terms of efficacy at this point, uh, from a, a, a clinical perspective, if a patient says to you, uh, just again, in terms of efficacy, do you think there's a reason to think that maybe the Nalirifox regimen might be more or less or the same efficacious wise to say full, modified Fulfirinox? In your mind, are they about the same efficacy wise? Yeah, in my mind, they're definitely very much the same efficacy. I don't think we have any proof or any data to suggest that Nalirifox is better than Fulfirinox. So I feel I have not actually yet switched to, uh, to Nalirifox in, in any circumstance just because I think Fulfirinox is, is just as good. The other issue is that the Nalirifox regimen, the way they did the study is there was a slightly lower dose of oxaloplatin, a slightly lower dose of the Naliri that we, what, that what we use for second-line therapy. And um, I haven't, I've gotten so used to using Fulfirinox in the way that I do things. And maybe I could be accused of being too set in my ways or the other side of the coin is that I'm comfortable with how I give it um, and probably won't deviate from that. So uh, I guess the other issue then is tolerability. And I, it sounds from what you're saying that you feel maybe a GEMNAB is somewhat more tolerable than the three drug regimens. And I would, do you think there's much difference in tolerability between uh, Fulfirinox and uh, Nal uh, Nalirifox? Certainly not from comparing the published data sets. No, I don't think there's any difference between Nalirifox in Fulfirinox. I think one thing that the other really valuable thing that the Napoli 3, 3 trial provided for us is it dispelled the notion that GEMNAT pack is necessarily a walk in the park. And in fact, the um, hematologic toxicity with GEMNAT pack was clearly worse than it was with Nalirifox. And that is definitely something that we see and is one of the reasons that many of us use every other week GEMNAT pack because of the hematologic toxicity. And uh, another question that we asked, and sort of getting back to what we were talking about before, just to sort of close out the kind of uh, chemo end and, and the usual therapy type end, are the phase three clinical trials that are going on right now that are of interest in uh, pancreatic cancer. Uh, everybody brought up the Alliance uh, A021806 trial. What's that? I think this is a really critical study um, for 10 plus years now, many of us have been convinced that we should be giving resectable patients preoperative neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but we've actually done that without any true proof. And then the NORPAC, stud, NORPAC 1 trial from the, um, the Northern Europeans just came out at ASCO, G at ASCO 2023 and kind of threw a monkey wrench and everything where it actually showed in a similar design study, albeit smaller phase two study, that actually patients who got neoadjuvant therapy did worse. Um, there was a lot of legitimate criticism to that study, um, not so much with the way they run this, ran the study, but which the way that we, that patients, um, a lot more patients were, uh, just got gemcitabine because they couldn't tolerate the fulfirinox, et cetera. Um, but it really raised the question, um, should we be giving neoadjuvant therapy? And the Alliance study and the parallel Dutch study will actually be telling us that definitively. So a lot of people have brought up the Apollo study, adjuvant or laparib. We'll talk about that when we get to a part. But you also brought up uh, the issue of the, the Zolbituximab study, GEMNAB, Zolbituximab. And I'm curious because it kind of sort of caught me off guard there. What do we know about the incidence of uh, Claudin uh, uh, positivity in uh, pancreatic cancer? 
and has uh, zolbituximab been looked at at all? Yeah, so um, it's definitely something that we're learning as we go along. But when you look at the zolbituximab, it's a, when you look at the quad 18.2 staining um, by the same criteria that was used for gastric cancer, so 3 plus uh, I8 by IAC as positive. In gastric cancer, the rate of positivity is about 30 to 35%. In pancreas cancer, it's about 20 to 25%. So it's not low. Um, and, and then in addition to that, if you actually look at any staining, it can be upwards of 90% in pancreatic cancer. And that's relevant, not to digress, but that's relevant for, for example, uh, antibody drug conjugates that may not necessarily need a high degree of expression. So given the 20 to 25% um, high expression with clod 18.2 in pancreatic cancer, um, I think paralleling the study that was done in gastric cancer with a similar pancreatic cancer study makes just perfect sense. And the um, ongoing phase two randomized trial, trial of GEMNAPAC with with um is, as I understand, fully accrued or very close to fully accrued and will give us an answer as to whether it actually increases survival for that patient population. That's really uh, interesting. Uh, another uh, trial that uh, we asked people about was the PANOVA-3 trial looking at uh, tumor treating fields. And of course, at ASCO, we saw a positive phase three trial, although a little controversial in non-small cell lung cancer, but there, particularly when you add it to an IO, if there seemed to be some benefit. There's also been a press release that went out recently, a negative uh, trial with uh, paclitaxel plus tumor treating fields in, ovari in ovarian cancer. Any thoughts about this strategy? You know, a lot of people look twice there. I remember when it first came out in uh, GBM, People are wondering about it, but, you know, it's like, it seems like we're kind of, particularly in pancreas, desperate for some other kind of mechanism. Uh, any uh, any thoughts about this idea? I, I think you're right that we are desperate to look for other ways. I think the science behind this has been uh, retrofitted, but I don't necessarily say that it's wrong. Um, I think that they've gone back and explained how this works after showing that it works um, in GBM. Um and, and I think that the trial in pancreas, I'd be very, very interested to see if it turns out to be a positive result. The only issue is that even if it does turn out to be positive, this is gemnab pack with or without the tumor treating fields for locally advanced pancreatic cancer. Um, the only criticism that will come is it's so cumbersome to have this device. So they basically recommend that the patients wear it as long as they can, which, you know, they advise at least 18 hours a day. And, you know, it's like kind of a, almost like one of those hernia girdles that you wear um, that you strap across the belly and the tumor treating fields is supposed to be exposed right over the pancreas in theory. So, yeah, we've heard uh, reports of people talking about uh, dermatitis from the electrodes and all. Um, also, we've heard that they're modifying the way they do it. So maybe it'll be less uh, toxicity. And we'll see whether or not they figure that out whether or not this is something or that there's some mechanism there that maybe we can tap into a little bit. So the, the interesting thing, and I, I applaud the Panova folks for looking for a, a, a hard endpoint of overall survival in that study. And it's interesting because if the study ends up being positive, it's the first study that's going to tell us that treating the local disease might improve survival when because we, we all think that the systemic disease is the bigger problem. And not to plug my own study, but we also presented it at, at, uh, at World GI in July, the intraarterial gemcitabine trial where we're giving gemnab pack, and then after a period of four months of induction, we're randomizing patients to intraarterial gemcitabine versus continuation of gemnab pack. And the FDA allowed the study to be, to, for an interim analysis to be reported. And even at the interim analysis, there was a six-month improvement in median overall survival for locally advanced disease. So maybe we actually can find different strategies to target the primary tumor in the pancreas and actually improve survival, even if we're not changing the overall systemic therapy. I hadn't heard about interarterial therapy before. How long has that been around, and how do you do it, and how do patients tolerate it? I was actually so skeptical when the when I got involved with this study about five years ago. I think they've been doing it for about seven years. It was developed by a cardiologist, of all people, and basically what they developed was a double balloon catheter system where the interventional radiologists will find the artery 
that is most proximal to the tumor. And then they will inflate these two balloons in the catheter and then inject gemcitabine between the two balloons. It increases the concentration and the uh, pressure to get the gemcitabine to the tumor cells significantly compared to, of course, just IV gemcitabine or gemnapac. And the hope is that by increasing the concentration and the pressure, it's getting more drug to deliver to those cancer cells in that very stroma-rich tumor environment and killing more cancer cells. And are you actually doing this procedure at Hopkins? We, we've been trying to get the study open. I really am hoping that we're going to get it open soon. But there's been more than 100 patients enroll, enrolled across the country thus far. Uh, University of Pittsburgh is actually the leader career thus far. And what's your vision about what's going on in terms of survival? I mean, I could imagine it's just a debulking thing, you know, like when you do debulking surgery with ovarian cancer and most of the tumor is local. Is that your thinking? I think so. And I, and I would have never, you know, five years ago, I would have never said that that would make such an impact on pancreas cancer. But maybe we're being shown that there is some value to, as you describe it, debulking. Interesting. You know, another thing I saw, as long as we're talking about papers that I was interested in from your bio, is uh, your interest in kind of looking for a biomarker to predict sensitivity to a regimen like fulfirinox, which I guess is really about the platinum, you know, an HRD type signature makes a lot of sense. Where are you right now with that? I, I think that we know that certain homologous recombination genes like BRCA and PALB2 are definitely uh, going to be predictors of response. The question is, how do we broaden that? What other DNA damage response and repair gene mutations may equally predict a response? Um, what about when you don't have a mutation and you just have a signature, like you brought up HRD signature, like they use in ovarian cancer? Um, and I think that our goal in trying to incorporate all of these is to try and increase the percentage of patients who might benefit from this to, you know, from 12, 15, 17% to maybe upwards of 25 to 30%. Interesting. Um, so let's, again, talk a little bit about some of the answers people gave in terms of, you know, their usual practices. So one thing, you know, we, again, talked about patients are presenting uh, in terms of neoadjuvant therapy, um, whether it's resectable or not at that point. And it looks like when people are using neoadjuvant therapy, whether it's resectable or, or borderline resectable, they're going with the three-drug regimen. But what about radiation therapy? In what situations do you do that? Because it looks like there's a lot of variation in that. There's so much variability, and I, it, ref, it reflects how much we just don't fully understand who benefits from radiation therapy. Um, and then because of that, I think we, we've moved away from incorporating radiation therapy early in the treatment and actually added on towards the end of treatment. So we institute systemic therapy first, and then in selected patients, and when I say selected patients, and this is, this is what I tell my patients too, is that we really make a game time decision that's meant to be a group decision between the surgeons, the radiation oncologists, the medical oncologists, and the radiologists as to who might benefit the most um, from radiation therapy. And there's different goals when I say benefit. The first goal, of course, is to try and render the tumor operable in a patient with potentially operable borderline resectable pancreatic cancer. We just presented a patient this morning in tumor board whose tumor has actually shrunk nicely, but still is just abutting the SMA. And has, she's had four months of uh, full fearnox. And the surgeon and the radiation oncologist said, you know, why don't you give two more months of full fearnox? We'll look at another scan, but then we might add in some radiation therapy afterwards. Their goal there is because they want to get the patient to the point of operability. A separate context is when do we use radiation for definitive therapy, meaning that we know that we can't do a surgery, but in the context, as you say, of debulking, how, how can we deliver enough radiation to kill most of the tumor to add to the overall um, survival of the patient? You know, when you were uh, talking before about Zolbituximab and Claudin 18.2, you sort of mentioned ADCs. And I was just thinking, because we talk about that all the time, almost every solid tumor, even hematologic tumors, actually, now that I think about it, have a ADCs. Anything happening at all in terms of antibody drug conjugates for pancreatic cancer? Yeah, definitely. There's some exciting data. Uh, it's all early phase, but there are definitely 
For example, clot 18.2 targeted uh, antibody drug conjugates. Gastric tissue and pancreatic tissue, normal tissue, has the highest expression of clot 18.2. And so the cancers that arise from those tissues are also the mo those that are most likely to retain expression of clot 18.2. And so upwards of 90% of pancreatic cancers harbor at least a little bit of clot 18.2 expression. So hopefully that will be something. There are other targets that are being explored as well, like trope 2 and mesothelin. These are things that have been studied for years. But is there an antibody drug conjugate targeting clot in point two right now? Yeah, yeah, there's really two or three. One, really, yeah, and I only know because we're opening up the study. But the study's been opened at other centers already, and I think that there are at least a couple more. Any objective responses that you know about? The drug was acquired from a Chinese company, and the Chinese group presented their data at ASCO this past year. The responses were all seen in gastric cancer because it's a gastric and pancreas cancer study. The responses were all seen in gastric cancer, but it was about a 50% response rate with the, with the ADCs. Really? In pancreas cancer, unfortunately, it was only stable disease patients, but it was actually a legitimate stable disease in some of the patients. Huh. Interesting. Um, let's uh, talk a little bit about second-line therapy. And I guess uh, one question would be, and we just go through it, what's your usual second-line therapy? And somebody who's gotten GEM-NAB up front, it sounds like that's more likely going to be an older patient. But what are you usually thinking about uh, second-line uh, in those people? Yep. I mean, we have a, a, a level one evidence trial in that space with 5-FU and Naliri. And so I just don't feel, I, I don't deviate from that trial. So I'll use 5-FU and Naliri in the patients who receive GEMNAP pack in the frontline setting. The only exception might be is if the, the rare patient who gets started on GEMNAP pack, we find out that they have a BRCA mutation or a PALB2 mutation during the course of their GEMNAP pack. I might choose to put that patient on maybe full FOX, maybe GEMSYS in the second line setting. But for most of the patients, it's going to be five of you now, Larry. And then I'll save full FOX for the third line setting, which unfortunately most patients don't get to. What do you think about the investigators, a number of whom say modified fulfirinox? post gem pack mm -hmm. I just, I can't imagine that a patient who you didn't think can tolerate gem uh, sorry, fulfirinox in the front line, it is all of a sudden going to be able to tolerate that in the second line. So that's why I tell patients, we're going to break up fulfirinox into fulfiri and fulfox, and we're just going to use them sequentially. Right. Yeah, I think that's probably what people were thinking. Mm -hmm. What about uh, second-line therapy in patients who've got three-drug first-line, let's say, Nolirifox or Fulfirinox? That's an easy one because then, then I use GEMNAP pack, and I use it every other week, um, and it's just much – it's very well tolerated. Um, can't, I can't say that it's all that effective, unfortunately, um, but it is the best that we have in the standard realm. I will routinely try and put patients on a clinical trial – as they transition from first to second line therapy. I think those are the best patients for trial uh, to try and investigate the effectiveness of new drugs. So um, we uh, talked about uh, looking for the possibility of being able to use a PARP inhibitor. So I, I, I assume that germline testing and if possible, either blood-based testing or NGS is standard uh, in the uh, upfront setting and the metastatic setting. You know, I'm always curious about the so-called real-world data that gets generated. We're actually getting ready to do, we're doing a big project with one of the groups, the American Oncology Network, trying to pull data, actually looking and to try to figure out how, how they take care of their their patients. But I, I am curious whether you think for real, whether people are actually getting, particularly germline testing, that is a very sore point because the answer is I don't think so. I think that the testing rates are, are really low. There was an interesting publication that came out where even internally they looked at how their testing rates increased when they in, when they instituted a program to make sure that the that the uh, uh, investigator or the physician remembered to send testing. And even though it did show an increase, it still only increased from a base of like fifty percent to up to about 70%. So that means that without any program instituted, still only half the patients are getting tested at an academic center that's that's looking into this. Nationally, we don't really know what the testing rates are, but it's been long suspected to be only about 30 to 
And germline testing is even less than that. It's only about 10 to 15%. It's, it's woefully low. I know that that's also true in ovarian cancer and breast cancer and lung cancer. Um, I just don't know how to institute programs that say we just need to test these things reflexively. You know, I don't know whether or not it's because I'm talking to oncologists all the time who are like extremely on top of things and maybe they're not typical. But, you know, I see this all the time, you know, CLL, there's supposedly 25% of people aren't, aren't getting, you know, BTK inhibitors of venetoclax up front, which is hard to believe. And I guess I always believe that, that docs are informed and, and uh, doing what they need to do. I wonder, you know, is the data being co uh, collected correctly? I mean, do you think this is for real? I, I mean, I guess, and I think, really. I think we, we, we are in such an echo chamber that, you know, the people that we talk to, of course, we all test. I track my patients right. on a spreadsheet and I keep track of whether I'm remembering to test them or not. But I think the reason I believe this is because the studies that there have been studies done on just our pancreatic cancer patients receiving any treatment of any kind. And uh, more than 50% of patients with a pancreatic cancer insurance diagnosis and ICD-10 diagnosis are not getting any treatment for their pancreatic cancer. Hmm. I remember hearing that about AML before HMA venetoclax came out. And but you think that is that yeah that's what I was wondering. Do you think that the maybe the lack of testing is part of the pessimism of the disease? Oh, for sure, for sure. Because you know, I mean, I can remember very vividly. We had a case a couple of years ago, patient metastatic pancreatic cancer, uh, who got you know. Of course, most people don't are not germline positive, but that patient was germline positive. His, uh, I think he had a niece who ended up getting tested, was positive, mm -hmm. had prophylactic, you know, prophylactic surgery, you know, maybe prevented either a breast or ovarian or pancreatic uh, or some other kind of cancer. Uh, so, you know, I guess I'm sure you've seen tons of examples where the family is almost a legacy that the patient leaves for the family. Yeah, yeah. I would love to, for those who are studying this, I, I'm eager to see what the results of that kind of what they call cascade testing is going to reveal are we increasing survival rates in breast ovarian and even pancreas cancer because the family members are also getting tested so let's talk a little bit about the use of parp inhibitors uh in pancreatic cancer uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, what the trials are what the data is that we have right now and what your approach is uh in your own practice sure. yeah so we have a handful of anecdotal trials uh, out of UPenn, uh, the one out of MD Anderson with Rucaparib, but really ultimately the big trial was the POLO trial using the PARP inhibitor Elaparib in the maintenance setting. And the study was designed paralleling the studies designed for ovarian cancer, looking for the benefit of adding a PARP inhibitor after a period of platinum sensitivity in the maintenance setting. And because of that, again, paralleling what was approved, what, what led to approval in ovarian cancer, they use primary uh, progression-free survival as their primary endpoint. And so the study was uh, done across the world. It enrolled about 150 patients. And ultimately, the trial was positive where there was an improvement in progression-free survival compared to placebo after a period of at least 16 weeks of platinum-based therapy for patients with germline BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutated pancreatic cancer. The disappointing part was that a, a year later, when the overall survival data was released, it turned out that the overall survival was not improved with patients put on um, Olaparib compared to placebo. But there were a lot of caveats there. First and foremost, the study wasn't designed to be able to detect an overall survival difference. And when you look at the survival curves, there was definitely a separation of the curves for overall survival, it just didn't meet the statistical significance. And of course, there was also crossover for patients who were uh, receiving uh, uh, PARP inhibitor after progression on placebo to then ultimately get some sort of PARP inhibitor. How do I use it? I, I really, you know, when you're treating metastatic pancreatic cancer, quality of life becomes as much of an important factor as does extension of life. And the convenience uh, of being able to move on to an oral therapy like a PARP inhibitor, even though it can have its own set of side effects, the convenience is so great and patients really appreciate the quality of life difference that I will routinely, of course, test patients and anybody with a BRCA mutation or a 2 mutation, I will try, try and get them access to a, a PARP inhibitor either in the context of a clinical trial or off study. 
And uh, you, do you view somatic uh, mutations the same as germline, from the, at least from the therapeutic perspective? I do. And I think we, we have a little bit of data to suggest that there may be equal benefit even in somatic patients. Kim Rice Binder did a maintenance RUCAP rib study. It was not a randomized study, but it was just a single arm study designed like the POLO study, where patients who had been on platinum based therapy, then had stable responding disease, were then put on maintenance RUCAP rib except that Kim allowed for somatic mutated BRCA, uh, somatic BRCA1, BRCA2 mutated patients to be enrolled. And definitely some of those patients have fared well, including one of my patients that she put on her study, who's now been more than five years on Rucaparib. Wow. Yeah, you hear those stories in a number of cancers. You wonder why those patients are different than the ones who don't make it five years. Any thoughts? Um, I think that we're there. So we've been trying to explore this for a while. One of the uh, definite thoughts is um, loss of heterozygosity of the, of the BRCA mutation. So if you're born with a germline BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, then to have the second gene lost in the tumor is a lot easier. So it makes sense that most of those germline mutated patients have two of their BRCA genes that are lost in the tumor. When you have a somatic-only mutation, you have to envision a scenario where both of those genes are lost within the tumor. But I think it does happen sometimes, um, probably a, to a lesser rate than it does for the germline. And as long as you've lost both of the alleles, then you have a dysfunctional BRCA, uh, BRCA protein. Any other mutations that'll get you to think about or try Olaprib? I know CHECK2 and ATM are not uncommon. Will you treat that? So good? I think we used to get excited about ATM, but I think enough, enough of us just anecdotally believe that ATM is not one that predicts for response to PARP inhibitors, at least not in pancreatic cancer. I know it's different in prostate cancer. Um, there are other rare mutations such as BRIP1 and BAP1, where there's a little bit of data where the, the PARP inhibitors can be a benefit there. Um, and then there's the, the infamous HRD signature that we just, we don't test very much in pancreatic cancer outside of the clinical trial, um, but may actually have some value as well. If you know a patient has, uh, for example, a BRCA mutation or BRCA germline mutation, you know, family history, whatever, what chemo do you give? If I, um, so, if, I, if they have a strong family history, and I'll accept that family history is not all that predictive of them having mutation, but nevertheless, if they have a strong family history or if they walk in the door knowing they have a BRCA mutation because they had a breast cancer five years ago, then I will certainly start them on either fulfurinox or actually I feel very comfortable with just gemcitabine and cisplatin based on um, Dr. O'Reilly's uh, phase two randomized trial. If I learn that they have the BRCA mutation during the course of their therapy, then I will stay with whatever I started them on, even if it's gemnab pack, but just have that information ready to pounce on if I'm going to put them on a platinum or a PARP inhibitor second line. Yeah, that's why I asked that question, because I find a lot of people talking about cisgem uh, in those patients. Cisgem, how that would compare to a three-drug regimen, fulfurinox or nilirifox? I don't think we have. In, we, we do. I mean, in, in the non-BRCA patients. In the non-BRCA right? patients. Um, well, we definitely don't have data. Um, I will just tell you anecdotally, I don't think GEMSYS works all that well in the non BRCA mutated patients. And my anecdotes for, to, to be able to say that come from exactly the scenario where you described, where you've got a patient walks in the door, you know, Ashkenazi Jewish, or where there's a higher rate of uh, BRCA mutations in that population, um, strong family history of breast and ovarian cancer, but a little bit older. So I don't want to start them on fulfurinox. So I put them on GEMSYS and then initiate their testing. And then two to four weeks later, lo and behold, they're not BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutated. I find those patients don't fare as well on GEMSYS as they might have on either GEMNAPAC or Fulfirinox. Interesting. Any thoughts? You know, we hear this a lot in ovarian cancer, I think in breast cancer, the hope, the idea that adding an IO to a PARP inhibitor is going to have benefit. I know SWOG has a study looking at a LAPR plus or minus uh, pembrolizumab, uh, kind of building on the POLO trial. Uh, any thoughts about where that's heading? Seems like there's some hints, and you know, maybe an ovary, but any thoughts? Well, I'm, I'm biased because I'm study co-chair for that SWOG trial that you just mentioned. Um, I certainly hope so. I think that the science behind it is very intriguing, um, and um, I think it's definitely worth doing the study. I, I would put patients on that study in, in a heartbeat. 
Um, there's some really interesting data that Peter, Peter Hussein from University of Miami um, has really started to build. Now, his study was just a retrospective look at a handful of patients they treated, but they treated them with IPI and Nevo. And there's some reason to think, well, maybe the CTLA-4 antibody is really ne needed in this scenario that just the anti-PD-1 is not sufficient. So in his his retrospective look at a handful of, a case series essentially of a handful of patients, there were patients who benefited um, from ipinevo for those who were known BRCA1, BRCA2 mutated who had previously been treated with platinums, et cetera. Um, ha ha are reversion mutations seen in patients who get uh, PARP inhibitors can a clinician you know, send an assay to pick up a reversion mutation? And what's the implication if you see it? Yeah, uh, uh, reversion mutations definitely ha happen in pancreatic cancer. We have no idea what the rate of reversion mutations is, whether it's 2% or 80% as conferring resistance to PARP inhibitors. Nobody knows what the, what the denominator or the numerator for that matter is, um, but it can definitely happen. Um, you can send a simple blood test to be able to detect this. Um, that's one place where the blood test actually can be really valuable. The problem with the re with testing for the reversion mutations, whether you test it for any of the retail companies, ironically, is that the retail companies aren't doing a great job in reporting it. So you'll get a BRCA uh, gene mutation on the report, and it typically has a much longer mutation look to the, the, the description of the mutation is much longer. Um, and that's because they're describing the nature of the revision, but they're not spelling it out for the clinician who doesn't know to look for this, that, hey, this is a reversion mutation. Um, we do know that the reversion mutations definitely confer resistance to PARP inhibitors and platinum. So I would, re I would hesitate to use a PARP inhibitor for a patient that I know had a BRCA reversion. So we asked a few sort of practical questions in our survey about the use of PARP inhibitors or laparib in pancreatic cancer. One uh, is the issue of GI toxicity, and most people are not using preemptive medication for that. But I just wonder in general how GI toxicity sort of fits in with people who already have a number, maybe already have some issues. It's so hit or miss, and patients who, it, 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 how they respond, how they tolerated, for example, fulfirinox well or not so well doesn't predict for how they're going to respond or how they're going to tolerate uh, Olaparib, for example, um, it's really hit or miss. But I definitely see some patients who sail through it and some patients who have a tough time for, uh, with it. We know we do have some data with this with the POLO trial where about 50% of patients in the POLO trial had to pause their therapy with the Olaparib and then go on a lower dose uh, of Olaparib. The good news from that was that all pa that zero patients stopped Olaparib because of toxicity, meaning that even if they had to pause and go on a lower dose, they were still able to continue on. So uh, another thing, this is kind of interesting. I'm kind of starting to see different parts of oncology kind of this point coming up, which is dose reduction, particularly of novel agents, and more and more emphasis on that. I don't know, you know, I kind of feel like maybe it's been a little slower in evolving than dose modification for like chemotherapy, for example. So one of the things we ask is, do people use dose reduction for toxicity? Everybody says yes. And you actually, uh, in the survey, talked specifically about how you do that. Can you talk a little bit about what it will take you to uh, reduce dose and how you do it? So I, I really sort of follow the protocol of the POLO study where um, patients will start on 300 BID of the Olaparib and then... Um, um, for appropriate, for, for the toxicities that make me concerned, sort of grade two, grade three, myelin suppression in particular, but even grade two or grade three, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, I'll pause the olaparib until their side effect recovers. And then sometimes it takes a week, sometimes it takes three weeks. But once they recover, then I'll go down to 200. If they experience it again, I'll go down to 100. Um, and that, again, that covers almost 100% of patients and able to being able to keep them on therapy. So uh, one of the things we also asked people was, uh, what's the longest time you've maintained a patient with metastatic pancreatic cancer or an APARP inhibitor? And, I mean, you said over five years you already commented on that, but everybody seems to have a bunch of patients who've gone, you know, a couple years uh 
Eileen has uh, some of you know, seven or eight years. Any thoughts about what makes these cases different than the typical cases? You no, know, I, I wish that I knew, and that's really the holy grail, trying to understand what it is about those patients. You know, the, what my one five-year patient that I share with Kim is, you know, a somatic-only BRCA mutated patient. I, I don't think we know. So I was actually just flashing on the fact we did a webinar last week with Katie Moore, who did the Solo One study in ovarian cancer, which was really, I think, the, maybe one of the trials that really opened up people's minds to uh, this whole strategy. And of course, one of the issues that uh, came out in ovary, and we were talking about this last week, is the issue of AML and MDS. And you would kind of think this is maybe a less appropriate or, you know, critical issue in terms of discussing with a patient with metastatic disease and say patient is going on the Apollo trial in the adjuvant setting, although even there, I don't think it's quite the same as the discussions that go on with, you know, breast or ovarian cancer patients. And actually, we ask people, do you bring this up to a patient with metastatic disease? And although, you know, a couple of people actually said no, which, you know, I can understand. Most people say yes. What do you say to a patient who's already got metastatic disease about that? Oh, I mean, I think of it as just another discussion for potential side effects. I mean, in the same way that I discussed the, you know, one in 10,000 patients who are going to have cardio coronary vasospasm spasm with 5-FU, I will also bring up the rate of MDS AML for the patients who might go on a PARP inhibitor. I'm also curious about your experience with cytopenias and PARP inhibitors in this setting, again, particularly Olaparib. What do you see? How often do you have to transfuse patients? I definitely see um, myelosuppression across the board. So unlike chemo, it's it's not just neutropenia and thrombocytopenia. It can definitely be anemia, and sometimes anemia is the most problematic one. Um, I would say I, I I transfuse probably a little bit less than others, only because I'm a little quicker to drop off the drug if I really start to see the hemoglobin dropping down. Um, but I'd still start probably say at least 25, 30% of patients Oh, also we need a transfusion. We were talking about the Apollo study, the adjuvant olaparib study. I wonder whether you've been in the position of uh, having a patient, you know, with a BRCA mutation in the adjuvant situation who asked you to use off-label PARP inhibitor. Would you or uh, have you? So I have. Um, prior to the study being opened, um, and actually, even when the study was open, I, I gave a couple of ampullary cancer patients with BRCA mutated pancreas, with BRCA mutated ampullary cancer who wouldn't have been eligible for the Apollo study. I gave them, um, adjuvant olaparib and, and I followed the study and gave it to them for a year. Um, it is a struggle actually when I, uh, um, when I offer the trial to patients now, they just want the off label olaparib. Um, and, um, you know, in, in good faith, we don't know if it's going to benefit them. And because there is this small but real risk of MDS AML, you know, I could be then doing them harm and without proof of benefit. So I, I try and nudge them towards the study. Another question I was going to ask you before is, do you ever see MSI high pancreatic cancer? I do. And um, it's, uh, it's, again, I will emphasize that it's still pancreas cancer because I have some MSI high patients who've done exceptionally well, but I've also seen a couple of patients who don't respond at all. And they're all MSI high, you know, high tumor uh, mutational burdens, but one or two of them didn't respond, which is incredibly disappointing for the for the patient and for me. But you've seen objective responses, oh, yeah. though, and people are... I've seen complete responses in, in a couple of cases. So let's talk about some other avenues of uh, clinical research interest. Uh, and one, I'm curious for your thoughts on actually Eileen presented a, a patient who had KRAS G12C. Of course, we talk about that a lot, particularly in lung cancer. What do we know about that in pancreatic cancer and KRAS inhibitors? So we know that the KRAS inhibitor, the KRAS G12C inhibitors work to the rate of probably about 40 to 50 percent response rate and upwards of 90 to 100 percent disease control rate for KRAS G12C mutated pancreatic cancer, and that's data with both satorosib and or sotoracid, however you pronounce it, and adagrosib as well. Um, so those are really exciting results, particularly for because those patients were, were uh, pretty heavily pretreated. The only disappointing thing, because it is still pancreatic cancer, is the duration of response is still relatively low, short. You know, six, seven month um, um, 
median overall survival and progression or progression free survival and not too far after that uh, in terms of overall survival. I think where the promising and exciting data for KRAS inhibitors is where you start to get into the world of combinations. Um, and if I can borrow from colon cancer literature, where Werner Jaeger had a trial of cetuximab with a dagrasib in KRAS G12C and mutated colorectal cancer, the response rate um, was much higher with the combination than it was with single agent adagrosib because you essentially are turning the tumor into a KRAS wild type tumor at least for a while, um, and so you you have the potential to get the benefits of the EGFR inhibitor as well. So studies like that are being designed in pancreatic cancer also. So right now, are you using uh, KRAS inhibitors in your patients, and in what situations, which one, and what do you observe? So if we see a KRAS G12C mutation, we are using a dagrasib or sotoracid, um, of course, off-label, um, if we can get access to it. We also are fortunate that we have a clinical, a couple of clinical trials with KRAS G12C inhibitors at Hopkins, and we also have a number of KRAS and PANRAS inhibitor trials as well. So those trials were uh, routinely referring our KRAS G12D, K, uh, G12R, G12B patients up for those uh, clinical trials. What are we seeing for the non-KRAS G12C um, inhibitors? I think it's just too early to tell. There are some patients that respond, but of the data that's been collected, it's probably on the rate of about 10 to 30 percent response rate. But that's that's really a preliminary look at these at this 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 body of of inhibitors. I never thought to ask anybody whether there's any antibody drug conjugates to uh, KRAS, is there? Uh, that's a great question, and actually, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know if it's specific enough. I would imagine. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Is, it, is it like too many normal, too much in normal tissue? I don't know. I don't know either, because certainly the memorial group was able to generate a vaccine targeted towards a specific KRAS mutation. So why couldn't they develop an antibody to it? I actually don't know the answer. The last thing I want to ask you about is vaccines. It's starting to creep up into my consciousness now in the last few months. Um, because uh, first there was a, a presentation at ASCO, I don't know if you're aware of it, and adjuvant therapy and melanoma, where they used this neoantigen vaccine that was developed by Moderna and targets neoantigens, individualized to the patient. Then I started to hear it other places. Then I see there's something kind of like that in pancreas also, I think Eileen's involved with that. So I'm just starting to figure out what this technology is. Maybe you can educate us a little bit. It sounds exciting. Anytime people hear the word and Moderna, they get all excited in particular, although I know there are other companies looking at the same thing. Actually, uh, when we did this program with Katie last week, I, a couple of days before, I got an email from a doc, not an oncologist who was a patient with ovarian cancer who was on her way to Boston to get one of these uh, neoantigens. So I guess it's for real. There's really out there. What is this and what are your thoughts about it? So I think the vaccine fall, vaccines fall into a couple of different camps. There's the um, vaccines that are patient tailored, that they're taking the patient's tumor and, and uh, developing a vaccine specific. As you can imagine, those are obviously much more labor intensive and costly and um, slower to produce. Um, the, and I, but I think they, they also have a lot of promise. Um, the current vaccine trials in pancreatic cancer, like the ones that Eileen presented at ASCO in 2023, um, were really just mRNA vaccines to a, a breadth of KRAS mutations. And it's very, very preliminary. I mean, we're all super excited about it. We're all flooding her with patient referrals, um, because we're excited about it. But so far, all they've shown is T-cell-specific T responses to that vaccine. And what I tell patients, it's like, how did we know the COVID vaccine worked? Well, we didn't initially. We just knew that there was a T-cell response or an immune response specific to the COVID vaccine. And that's kind of where we are right now with the pancreatic cancer vaccine. We know that there's an immune response specific to that vaccine. We just don't know yet if that translates to actually preventing cancer in patients. Interesting. Any other innovative responses? Um, I remember there's a, pa a, a patient presented who got something that sounded sort of like CAR T in the New England Journal. Any immune approaches uh, that look exciting? So that one was, I believe, that was the the Rosenberg 
group and well as with the Oregon group, but they were doing um, uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocyte injections that are that are generated towards um, that patient's tumor. Um, and and you know one of the patients had a very robust response, so there's an active trial going on. We're fortunate because it's you know six miles up the road at the NIH, so I refer patients there as well. Um, but there are other people doing Mark um, Mark O'Hara at UPenn has a really interesting trial that's in the similar vein of trying to look at vaccine or tar uh, patient personalized immune therapy for pancreatic cancer. I think this is a uh, this world is in its infancy, um, but it has a lot of promise. Have TILs been used, and do, do you see responses to TIL? I certainly don't, but I know that they have been used, and, and, the, and they can be of benefit. It's a very, very small number of patients who have benefited from these therapies, and the million-dollar question is, who, and who were they and why did they respond? And, and nobody really knows, but those studies are ongoing. Well, you know, we uh, had a lot of concerns about uh, CAR-T, and all that, all you have to go through with that. And now by specific is coming along and it looks like really encouraging. So maybe, uh, pancreatic cancer will go along that route. Who knows? Yeah. And I think the answer to that is to try and get patients on study because we just need to learn. And, and for better or for worse, the patients need to be our testing ground to prove that these therapies work. Well, unfortunately, there's no shortage of patients. That's for sure. True. True. Final question. I know we've talked about this in the past. Any new observations or comments in terms of palliative care uh, for pancreatic cancer? You know, this is a, every oncologist deals with the palliative issues. Any new pearls or things that have come out in that regard? Um, actually, there's a couple of areas that I've only learned about myself in the last year or so. First of all, there's a group of uh, investigators that are looking at uh, targeting cachexia specifically. So there, there are new therapies that really kind of work in the brain um, to try and limit the cachexia that comes from pancreatic cancer. And they are entering clinical trials. So those, those could be really exciting. There are also novel ways to try and attack the pain. Um, again, I'll keep pointing to the NIH just because they're, they're close by, but there's some really innovative um, uh, pain management trials that are being, uh, that are being studied and pancreatic cancer patients are often targets for that as well. What kind of pain strategies? You know, they're injecting something, and I, I'm going to show my ignorance of knowing exactly what it is, but they're injecting something into the CSF in the spine, huh. um, and it's working. It's not an opioid. It's working more in more specific ways on different different pain pathways than the op opioid pathways. Huh, that's fascinating. This concludes our program. Special thanks to Dr. Pishvayan, and thank you for listening. This is Dr. Neil Love for Oncology Today.